race to win awards and explore the stars, have created some of the most fantastic products ever designed, and we use them every day, unaware of their amazing origins. On Wicked Inventions, the Taxi Cap, the iconic London taxis, heroic exploits during the Blitz. Satellite navigation, how a US military tool points us in the right direction. The Lava Lamp, a piece of rocket inspired sheet that has landed in your living room. We reveal the amazing science and manufacture behind these wicked inventions. of London must rank in one of the most iconic images of the United Kingdom. Go back half a century or more, however, and you will find that the Black Cab had found an altogether more grim task than the party goes home on a Friday night. Every taxi operating on the streets of London had to have a 25-foot turning circle. It was this nimble ability and the skill of the drivers in knowing their way around everything from busy traffic to burning buildings that afforded the taxi the chance to earn its place in wartime history. In World War II, London itself had become a target. Because the German Luftwaffe was scattering incendiary bombs over the East End, countless fires broke out that threatened to join together in the dreaded firestorm. The London fire crews were overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of small fires breaking out, and there simply were not enough pumps to attend. So, how to get a small fire crew to the heart of the problem when they hadn't the vehicle spare? The answer was as easy as hailing a cab. It was to make, make good with what you've got. So taxis, because uh, fewer and fewer people were you, you know, in cities using them for business, for example, Taxis um, were a very useful way of uh, taking firemen because they could take five or six firemen in the back of a taxi and they, were, they really did help out in the big fires that were created in the east end of London during the Blitz. Taxi drivers had an encyclopedic knowledge of the routes around London. Every back street shortcut could save lives with property in a taxi's race against time. And with a small water pump towed behind, or manhandled into the luggage area of the cab, the fire crew could be in attendance and fighting the flames quicker than a full-size pump busy elsewhere. They were often also used by air raid wardens um, and the observation corps. The observation corps um, used to uh, have people at fairly remote locations, you know, trying to search the skies for intruder aircrafts. And in order to get those people to those remote locations, they often use the London taxi cab. So the next time you hail a cab, just remember the dark past that they've endured and leave a generous tip. The London Taxi Company has been established for over 60 years, originally trading under the name Car Bodies Limited and supplying car bodywork to many car manufacturers, as well as the Queen of England herself. Based at its original location in Coventry, England, and now trading as the London Taxi Company, this historical car manufacturer now has 24,000 cars operational in London alone, as well as boasting a growing worldwide market. Today's London taxis begin life as grey shells of bodies sent over from Shanghai in China. On arrival, these shells are placed under a green light and carefully scrutinised to check for any small bumps and scrapes they may have picked up on their long journey overseas. Once thoroughly checked, it's time to coat the bodies in their trademark black paint, as well as any one of the many colour options available to customers. They do a whole range of colours, not just black. We have something like 24 different colours we can paint, and we can mix and match any colour you like. The bodies are then dried and polished to a slick sheen. The freshly polished and painted shell is then lifted onto the conveyor belt to begin the pre-mount process. During this pre-mount stage, the engineers will fit many of the complicated internal components, including the door locking system, the heater unit, as well as more of the electronics, such as the high-mounted rear brake lights, radio and microphones, before moving on to fitting the windows. London taxis can sometimes be on the road for 24 hours at a time, 
So one of the key features of these vehicles is their strength and durability. It has to be durable and reliable. If you think about it, its main function in life is to, is to be on the road. And there's very little modern vehicles in this, in this day and age which can sustain that cycle. And some of the mileage that these things clock up are phenomenal. And, and they, they are very, very durable. Well, what we call the taxi duty cycle is the most arduous one of any motor vehicle. It's harder than buses or trucks or anything like that because taxis by and large work in congested urban environments with a lot of stop start and that puts a lot of wear and tear on, uh, on the engine and the components there. Whilst the body of the car is being prepared on one production line, the chassis is also being prepared simultaneously on another. The chassis line begins with the rear axle dressing process. The rear axle and front suspension or beam are made in China and delivered trackside before being fitted by the operator, along with rear wheel sensors, brake lines, power steering hoses and pipework. The chassis frame is also prepared by installing the steering box, anti-roll bars, the handbrake cable and the steering rods. The engine is made in Italy by VM Motori before being shipped to the London Taxi Company and fitted as part of the powertrain unit. Along with the suspension, engine, gearbox, rear axle and exhaust system, these are all coupled and assembled to complete what is now the rolling chassis of the taxi, before finally adding the all-important wheels. Everything's hand-built, everything's hand-painted, so everybody's touch and feeling the vehicle all through the process is right till the, the past the sales. Most vehicles, you know, from start to finish, if you started on a Monday, we'd be happy if that was going on its way to a customer on the Friday. Now that the taxi's body and the chassis have been prepared, it's time to bring the two together in what is affectionately known as the marriage of the carriage. The body is lifted and carefully carried over to the chassis. It is then lowered onto it, all under the watchful eyes of the expert mechanics and engineers. The body is guided into position by six location pins, which align the body with the chassis frame outrigger points. This is where the body is bolted down to the frame by 12 fixing points. Electrical connections from the powertrain to the vehicle main harness can now be made. The fuel tank is then connected to the fuel pipe and filler neck. Engine hoses and pipework are also connected. Once completed, the body and chassis are pushed onto the mount line. This is where it begins to become more recognisable as the iconic London taxi. On the mount line, the rear centre division is fitted. The seats and seat belts are also fitted here as part of the full completion of the interior of the cab. The exterior side and front panels of the cab can now be added. These are designed to be easily replaceable in order to minimise the time the cab is off the road in case of accidents and damage. The final components are fitted to the engine bay and after one last inspection, the cab is washed, waxed, polished and ready to hit the streets worldwide. Getting lost on a strange road in the middle of the night is not something anyone enjoys. Being able to tell where we're going is essential, not only for the everyday driver, but it is particularly important when you're a soldier in the middle of a hostile land with low visibility. In those situations, getting lost can be a death sentence. Navigation has always been vital to armies. If you get it wrong, then a disaster. You take the Romans trying to navigate their way through the Teutoburg Forest in Germany. They got it wrong. The Romans were wiped out, trapped and finished. But as we move closer to us in history, maps, with a map you need a compass. You need people trained to know how to move from here to there. Photographers to actually make the maps. And then, with the advent of the aeroplane, you can actually see the land from above. But you needed communications for the pilot to speak to the people on the ground. But nowadays, of course, with the use of the satellite, navigation is literally a modern art. The US military developed what has become an extremely effective location system that today not only allows soldiers to evade the enemy, but also allows us to find our favorite coffee shop, satellite navigation. This incredible technology allows us to pinpoint our exact location via the use of small electronic devices. 
The more recent uses of this system allow us to plan a journey, to find particular places or businesses, and even to be able to locate friends and family members. Not too long ago, this technology was the stuff of science fiction and spy movies, but today it has become a common part of our everyday lives. Not just in phone technology, but also it, it, because it can track um, uh, people or animals is very useful for uh, a whole range of other activities. I mean, certainly um, uh, electronic tags for, for criminals, but also in the conservation area, people want to know where animals are migrating to, whether it's polar bears. I mean, a lot of research has happened recently on, on polar bears and where they're moving and the fact that the ice flows are, are reducing, etc. A lot of that is down to GPS, which are, which are fitted, which are updating their position so they don't get lost. But how does this technology actually work? Like the name implies, the SatNav is a system of satellites that provide autonomous geospatial positioning with a global coverage. It literally is satellite navigation, employing the basic principles of triangulation. Positioning yourself uh, in, in a, in a three-dimensional space using triangulation is very old. It goes back to Euclidean uh, geom geometry. Uh, and so basically it boils down to knowing distances and angles to a point between where you are and uh, a number of points of reference. Because you're trying to define your position in a three-dimensional space, um, if you just think about it, you need to find your position uh, with regard to uh, the X, the Y and the Z axis. So you need four satellites really to be able to de determine your position accurately. The Global Positioning System, or GPS, is the most used space-based satellite navigation system. It was designed initially for military use at the height of the Cold War and inspired by the Soviet spacecraft Sputnik. GPS has gradually grown in size, with more satellites being used, giving the military even more accurate geographical data that allows them to pinpoint both their own and also the enemy's exact position. There are three parts to the Navstar GPS system. The network of satellites, a control station on Earth that manages the satellites and your receiving device. There are 24 Navstar satellites, and each one is constantly beaming out a radio wave signal towards Earth, and your receiver listens out for these signals. Each signal travels at the speed of light and contains information about which satellite it came from and the precise time that it was sent. Because these signals travel at the speed of light and the satellites are in known positions, your receiver can use this information to pinpoint its position. So modern GPS receivers are indeed very small uh, devices and they can be very low power, they just need to pick up uh, the signal. So how does the network of satellites plot your exact location? Usually, your GPS device would need to be able to pick up four satellite signals as a minimum to give you an accurate position. Let's colour code our four satellites range, red, green, blue and yellow. If your device is picking up a signal from the red satellite, then we know roughly where you are, but we do mean roughly. If you're picking up the green satellite signal, then your position can be narrowed down, but there is still a fair degree of error. Add in blue, and where these signals intersect gives your accurate position. Finally, if your elevation is needed, the yellow signal will triangulate with the other satellites to provide that information. With so much widespread usage and such reliability, the SatNav is definitely staying with us and constantly evolving. For that and the bright future that it has, the SatNav is one of our favourite wicked inventions. So, we've seen the modern GPS technology is simple to use, powerful and gets us to where you want to go fast. But what if we haven't got our GPS to hand and we are stuck in the middle of nowhere? Then what? No fears, our intrepid tester is going to show you how to navigate the old school way. First off, if you're organised then you will have a map and compass to hand. Hurrah! Just find your position and navigate your way out of trouble. Just make sure you take your time to accurately work out the correct features, or a mistake will mean you might have to retrace your steps. But what if you have no compass and no map? What if you find yourself in a featureless terrain? Panic? Well, not quite. Let's find north. Have you got a wristwatch? Yes? Brilliant. First of all, do we know which hemisphere we are in? The northern hemisphere? Right. Then point the hour hand at the sun. 
at south will be halfway between the hour hand and 12 o'clock. So, if we face that southerly direction, we know that north is behind us, and east is to our left, and west is to our right. Once we have established our compass points, we can then decide which way we need to walk to safety. And if you find yourself in the southern hemisphere, then you can use the exact same method, but you'll be facing north rather than south. But what if you have a digital watch, or none at all? Fear not, can you find a stick or a long, thin, straight object? Yes? Then good. Push the stick into the ground and place a rock or object at the top of the shadow that it casts. Wait 15 minutes and you will notice that the shadow has moved. Now mark the new position. Because the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, the first position is your west point and the second your east. If you draw a straight line between the two points and another line that bisects the first, then you will have created a north-south, east-west axis. You can now start to move in the direction you need. The 1960s, a decade that immediately conjures up images of bright colour, flower power, fashion, diversity and freedom. It was a time of expression, conflict, and most notably, looking to the stars. The space race was in full swing, with the Soviet Union and the United States plunging their resources into the dream of the time to land a man on the moon. Television screens were awash with images of planets, satellites, spacesuits, and rockets. It was no surprise that this race would eventually influence design and fashion across the world. The rocket ship had become an icon of a generation, and a whole new one was born with it. Enter the lava lamp. Picture any classic 1960s household, and there's probably a lava lamp sitting somewhere in pride of place. But who thought of these iconic ornaments in the first place? British inventor and eccentric Edward Craven Walker came up with a lava lamp while sitting in his local pub, watching a newly designed egg timer bubble away on the stove and he spent years formulating this egg timer into a lamp. And then he eventually worked out how to make it happen and he launched it in 1963 uh, here in Paul. He had a, a little band called Smokey uh, with a picture of an astro on the side. Um, and they used to drive around the country selling lava lamps from the back of this van. But they, they did well, they managed to get them into selfridges and habitat and all sorts of places. So it must have been quite fun in those early days. It was then that Mathmos lamps were founded and began producing the now world-famous Astro Lamp. The science behind this iconic invention is quite simple, but is no less amazing because of its simplicity. Inside the lamp, there are blobs of wax, and when heated by the incandescent bulb, the changes in density makes the wax rise and fall in thick globules, giving the impression of lava. Fast forward to today, and the lava lamp is still as popular as ever, with plenty of celebrity names seeing them as a must-have fashion accessory for their homes. Well, from the musical world, there's the Beatles. Ringo Starr bought one uh, in the late 90s. Paul McCartney and Linda McCartney had them on their stage, and I know that Linda McCartney used to collect them. David Bowie had one in his recording studio, so lots of connections there. Nothing encapsulates a space-crazed and fashion-conscious generation better, and for that reason, the lava lamp is one wicked invention. The base and cap for the lava lamp are made from spun aluminium at the Newtech spinning facility in Devon, England. Using contemporary technology and manufacturing techniques along with traditional metal spinning knowledge, the fully automated metal spinning robots are able to produce the base and caps for the lava lamps with speed and precision. This means that they will be exactly the right fit when combined with the glass bottles that will give the lava lamps their famous rocket ship look. Once the aluminium has been spun to the correct shape and size, they are polished and then subassembled with a cord set and bulb ready to be matched up with the glass bottles. The crystal clear bottles are produced at the Stoltz Falconage Glass Factory in West Yorkshire. With over a century of experience behind it, this factory has become a state-of-the-art glass production facility. The bottles for the lava lamps are made on a fully automated production line. Glass is made here by heating and combining several natural raw materials, the main ingredient being silica sand. These are then combined and heated to extremely high temperatures in a furnace that can reach upwards of 1700 degrees Celsius. 
the huge furnace is capable of producing 110 million glass containers a year. This produces a gooey liquid of molten glass that pours out of the furnace and through shears that cut the glass into cylinders, ready to be dropped into the moulds of the bottle forming machines. These machines can shape the glass in a matter of seconds, and we now have our recognisable bottle shape. The bottles are then cooled at a controlled rate in a layer to ensure they don't crack from temperature shock. The bottles are individually checked by hand throughout production to ensure they are the best possible quality, ready to be turned into lava lamps. They are then tested to ensure they are exactly the right size, weight and strength. After one last visual check, they are then boxed up and sent on their way, ready to be turned into lava lamps. Upon arrival at the MathMoss headquarters in Dorset, the raw bottles are carefully inspected by hand and quality rechecked. The actual lava component of the lamps is made up of a wax formula, the exact ingredients of which remain a closely guarded secret to this day. The next step is to mix the formula in a large vat. This vat can produce 300 lamps worth of wax per batch. The wax comes in a hard block and um, that is melted along with two other chemicals. They're blended up and then uh, left to settle. Using a hydrometer, I test the wax for the density. Obviously, this is very key. You've got to get it correct. Otherwise, the bottle will either overheat too quickly or it will not work. The bottles are then treated with a solution in order to prevent the wax from clinging to the sides. When this is done, the raw bottles are injected with the all-important warm wax from the vat before being weighed to ensure exactly the precise amount of wax is being used. The next up is a key element in the creation of a lava lamp. A metal coil or spring is dropped into each of the bottles. This spring is vital to the lava lamp's functionality. The spring um, acts as a heating element and also it breaks the surface tension up of the wax. If you didn't have the spring in, then all you would have is just a ball of wax floating in the middle, not doing anything. The bottles are now filled with a master fluid, another very closely guarded secret, although we are told it is water-based. Once the master fluid has been added, the newly filled bottles are submerged into a tank of warm water at a temperature of 72 degrees Celsius. Doing this will warm the wax, making it sit neat and level at the bottom of the bottle, as well as ensuring the wax is neat this tanking process also shock tests the bottles and ensures the finished lamps will withstand being taken from cool to warm temperatures. The bottles are then left to cool overnight. The liquid suggested using a syringe to either um, put more in or take some out. Now that the bottles are at the correct liquid level to ensure a safety air gap, it's time to seal the caps. Hot glue is pumped onto the threads of the glass. A compression tool that tightens the caps. After one final quality control test, the bottles are cleaned and fully assembled with a metal base and cap. They're now ready to be packed and distributed to customers worldwide, as popular now as they were over 50 years ago. So there you have it. A dash through the hidden history, super science and amazing manufacture of products that you use every day but have never realised their amazing background. The taxi cab, satellite navigation and the lava lamp. All with an invention.